Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Welcome to our Crest International Seminar Series 2022. So this is our second session. So first of all, we would like to uh, introduce Crest. So Crest is for Center on Risk Engineering Software Technologies. At Crest, researchers are leveraging existing software engineering, analytical reasoning, natural language processing, and machine learning tools and techniques to develop secure and integrated software systems. So Crest is in close collaboration with industry and government partners such as DST, TSS, ATO, Gemini, Cisco, DST Group, Health SA, and Defense SA. Crest has mainly five research clusters which are focused on um, diverse, um, diverse research focuses. So for example, for the first cluster is the software security intelligence, which works on vulnerability assessment analysis and prioritization, and of course, of the uh, data quality. And next is the security orchestration and automation cluster, which works on the orchestration and automation of cybersecurity incident response, and also focuses on uh, providing different automated recommender systems to support the security operations center teams. Next is the socio-technical cluster, which focuses on the socio-technical factors of software engineering, such as um, patch management, DevSecOps, et cetera. Next is our big data analytics cl um, cluster, which focuses on cloud-driven solutions for security and privacy of big data. And lastly is the distributed ledger cluster, which focuses on blockchain technologies, integration with IoT sub and supply chain. So uh, this is the Crest composition. So Crest is uh, quite a huge group with uh, third, around currently around 30 researchers working on this group. So our lead is uh, Professor M. Ali Babur, who is a professor in School of Computer Science, University of Adelaide. So he has published more than uh, 240 peer reviewed papers in premium software technology journals and conferences with more than 11,000 citations. So in our group, we have uh, different faculty members, postdocs, PhD students, and research engineers who are continuously providing their constant support to develop and flourish this team. So next, we will uh, introduce our today's speaker, which is Dr. Uh, Shuranga Sinavaratne. So he's a lecturer in security at the School of uh, Computer Science in University of Sydney. He received his PhD from University of New South Wales and received his um, bachelor's degree from University of Morachua. His current research interests include privacy and security in mobile systems, AI applications in security, security of machine learning, and behavioral biometrics. He has published over 40 reviewed pa peer reviewed papers in top tier venues such as CVPR, WWW, MOBIC, SIGCOM, and IMWUT, UBICOM. His research has been often translated into solutions beneficial to the industry and the general public covered by top international and local media outlets such as Forbes, ZDNet, SMH, and The Sun. He received Dean's Award for Industrial Collaborations in 2019 in recognition for his work with the industry of defense. So thank you, Dr. Suranga, for joining us today. So we are looking forward to your, uh, to this seminar. And yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining the session. So today I'm going to talk a bit about the work we have been doing for about last four, four and a half years on encrypted traffic analytics and defenses. Uh, uh, this is more like a talk to uh, show, uh, discuss to what we have been doing rather than going into deep into details of the work. So I'll give, uh, give you an idea on what encrypted traffic analysis is, wh what we have been doing over the years and you know what kind of defenses are available there. So uh, as Arin said, I'm Suranga Saniratna. I'm a lecturer in security at the School of Computer Science, the University of Sydney. Uh, right, so first I will define what uh, traffic fingerprinting or traffic analysis attack is. And then I will walk you through three pieces of work we have doing, been doing. Uh, what is the basic traffic fingerprinting attack? And you know how you can use explainable AI to identify these machine learning models, how understand these machine learning models used in traffic fingerprinting. And I will work, uh, I will also go through a problem, go through the problem of what is called as the open set traffic classification, which is crucial when it comes to real world deployments of traffic fingerprinting systems. I'll go, go through a bit on what are the open research questions, what we have been doing these days, followed up with a brief overview of my research group uh, at the University of Sydney. 
Um, all right. Um, so I think most of us know these days that if you are browsing the internet, you should use HTTPS, you should use encryption. Uh, even my parents, grandmother knows that if you go into the internet and if you don't see that tiny padlock in the address bar, that is not safe. People, all, people, most of people know that already. So now 90 to 95% of internet traffic is encrypted one way or other. It can be VPN traffic, it can be HTTPS, different encryption, but 90 to 95% of the traffic is already encrypted. This is a huge leap uh, starting given that in 2017, for four years, five years ago, it was only 50%. And there was this huge push from companies like Google for people to move to HTTPS, which makes sense. And as of January, 2022, almost Google traffic across go all Google services like Google Drive, Gmail, it's very close to 100% that everything is encrypted. But end-to-end -end encryption uh, is like a double-edged sword. Uh, as you might see what is happening in Australia with uh, anti-encryption bills. Uh, so in general, there is this conception that it's very good tool for privacy. As internet users, we need it. But also behind encryption, lots of bad things are happening. Malware use encryption to communicate with the command and control server. And there are like, uh, over Tor, there are illegal stores like uh, Silk Road, et cetera. And a recent report like last week from the Online Safety Commission uh, in Australia, they cast doubts on encryption and say, you know, this has been misused in child pornography, bullying, all illegal activities, so we should do something about it. Uh, so what, what we are doing is in these days is kind of an intermediate solution that, yes, you need end-to-end -end encryption, but you know how to give law enforcement access, we actually don't know how to create these keys, we don't know. So at the in between, there is something we can do already, so that is what we are doing. Now, uh, so, HTTPS, which is the core of end-to-end -end encryption in internet, was kind of a hack. In fact, what happened was that in 70s, late 70s, 90, uh, 80s, the most of the research was on how to get the networks working. You had the OSI stack, then you came up with the TCPIC stack and the problems were how to reduce latency, how do we get the bandwidth, how to do error control, all of these things. And security was not even a design goal when TCP IP was uh, formulated. And when it comes to early 90s, people realized that, okay, you know, we need to do something about security. But at that time, much of the infrastructure of the internet was already set in place. And the giants like Cisco and all these switch manufacturers, they have put the routers in, they have put the switches in. It's extremely challenging to change things in the infrastructure. We have an architecture where you have encryption or security by design. So what we did was we plugged in security in the easiest place we can do. So we, we made it in, bit, in between, we implemented it in between the transport layer and the application layer layer 3.5, so to speak. The problem with that approach is that once you do that, irrespective of the encryption, there are, there are side channel information leaks. The packet sizes, timing between packets, uh, when this packet arrives, all this information leaks about the con actual content that is being encrypted. No matter how powerful your encryption is, it's very easy to conduct a side channel attack and identify some of the activities users are doing over the internet. Uh, so these activities, this, th these attacks are generally called as side channel attacks. They have been demonstrated as early as 1998. And, uh, most of the recent attacks were, so from about 2005, these attacks became more machine learning based rather than 
IP port or other metadata based. And what we saw is that, you know, around 2015, this is where like three years after the, after what, uh, what is the rebirth of deep learning or neural net, that people came up with really powerful side channel attacks against HTTPS that actually were beating state of the art defenses uh, during that time. So all of, if you go to a security conference these days, any of these side channel attacks are deep learning based. It can be MLP, it can be CNN, LSTM, you name it. All of them are deep learning based. Uh, now, so before we go into, so our, our focus, as I said earlier, is to understand how these side channels leak information, what protocols are vulnerable for this, and also understand this black box deep learning models in the context of uh, side channel attacks. Right? Before I go to that, um, also, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to ask it uh, in the chat. I'll uh, look at the chat time to time or else we can discuss it at the end as well. Um, so if you try to formalize the problem, uh, what, what is exactly a side channel attack? So the threat model is something like this. So there are users who are browsing the internet using end-to-end -end encryption. They might be using a personal network, institutional network, doesn't matter what it is. And there is this attack. So in this case, I have a highlighted network administrator, but there can be evil attackers. So what they, what they want to do is they want to passively use drop what this, this encrypted traffic flows of these users and try to identify what they are doing, uh, what websites they are visiting, if they are using a messenger application, what kind of activities they are doing. Are they sharing a photo? Are they sharing a video? If they are browsing a streaming platform like YouTube, what particular video they might be using? That is the threat model. So how usually you do this is that attacker collects their own data by replaying videos, visiting websites, depend on the target activity. Train the neural network, doesn't have to be a neural network, but you know, for our work, I will say that, you know, attacker is training a neural network. And in future, if there is a traffic flow coming, the attacker observe the traffic flow, send it through the neural network and infer what exact website the visitor is using or what exact online activity the visitor is doing. And based on that, the attacker can actually decide, okay, should I block this activity or should I continue with this activity? Uh, so this attack or defense, so to speak, can be used in different contexts. For example, in an institutional network, you might need to block certain sites that are riskier or that are not productive in terms of the work sense. And you can have a system like this to identify, okay, what, we, we don't allow this website. So you deploy this model, you block, uh, you know, blacklist uh, this website. Or in a more broader sense, you can develop a surveillance application using this. You can do a, some sort of massive surveillance where you can identify what people are doing uh, for an anonymous network like to the Onion router. Or you can also have something like uh, censorship where you don't want to interfere directly. So you passively observe and you block certain sites. Okay, so there are good applications as well as bad applications in this. Um, we actually don't sort of comment on, you know, what is good or bad. We just conduct site channel attacks in different types of traffic. Right, so uh, this, is, this is a snapshot of what we have been doing in last four or five years. Uh, so, we have been collaborating a lot with uh, Data61, CSIRO, D, uh, DSPG on this big project, uh, which recently finished. And we, we were able to create a body of work around this. So first thing we did was, uh, yeah, so the first one we did was, we were trying to figure out, okay, you know, Usually with HTTPS and TLS, this has been shown already. But what about new protocols? What about you know, other encryption? Can we infer the same? For example, 
if you consider Wi-Fi or VPN traffic, this traffic is encrypted two, three times. It's encrypted using TLS or HTTPS already, and Wi-Fi is already having another layer of encryption, WVA2 these days. Still, we found that those traffic leak site, uh, leak information about what users are doing. VPN, again, two layers of encryption, HTTPS and uh, VPN layer, layer, depending on the, it's layer two or three, still leaks information. Then we, uh, DNSO HTTPS, DOH, there's a huge push towards using DOH by all the browsers, Google, Chrome, Microsoft, et cetera. Same, this is, this is uh, good because plain DNS is not encrypted and someone can monitor that and it's not good for privacy. Uh, it makes sense, but we actually conducted tra traffic fingerprinting attacks on DNS or HTTPS and figured out that it's not as private as we think. What is happening in smart homes, smart home devices like Google Home, or even smart home controlling systems using ZBIV, they all leak information. That's what we found. Then we think about, okay, you know, if you want to make things more practical, you actually need this open set traffic classification. That is, there are millions and billions of traffic flows if you consider an ISP or enterprise network. But your target traffic, the websites you want to monitor or websites you want to block are in the range of thousands and hundreds. How we are going to identify this? For this, we need to tackle this problem of open set traffic classification. So we were, we were looking at what are the existing methods, benchmarking them, and also we are building novel methods of open set classification. And also another related aspect is that when you have millions and billions of traffic flows, how we are going to sample them? You can't make predictions of each and every traffic flow. You have to identify which might be a potential traffic flow you want to observe and make the prediction. We work on sampling strategies for that. And also we are working on something called as the inline traffic analysis attack. That is we predict as the traffic come by. We don't wait until 50, 100 packets uh, to arrive and feed it to the machine learning classifier. We feed it as the packets arrive. Then we realize that, uh, you know, everyone knows this, that deep learning is black box. And if you want to get these insights and figure out, okay, why these slide channel attacks are there, we want to use explainable AI to identify, okay, how these traffic classifiers work. Once you do that, you can actually think about how we can develop defenses. Okay. So that is the overall body of work. Uh, it was about uh, half a million uh, projects from DSDT with uh, uh, UTS and UCID as partners. Uh, we were able to do quite a lot of work on this during the last few years. Right. Okay, so uh, in the first part, uh, I will introduce a basic traffic fingerprinting attack, a work we did called as the content, where we try to identify what exact videos users are watching by simply observing the Wi-Fi traffic. How we are going to observe Wi-Fi traffic? Very easy. For example, if I have a target home, I go and park my car outside. They have this, we have these dongles which are which are Wi-Fi Wi-Fi sniffers, and you can you know start capturing Wi-Fi traffic. Usually, this is not a threat because everything is encrypted. The attacker sees only encrypted packets. But if the attacker is a bit smart, they can use machine learning and figure out what is happening over the Wi-Fi network. So the attacker we are considering here is a local attacker residing in the same vicinity as a Wi-Fi network. So here we focused on uh, video, mainly because you know video is the most dominant traffic in the internet, composing about 
80% of all internet traffic. And there are multiple video streaming platforms, YouTube, Netflix, Stan, you name it. And also there is a security requirement with these that these platforms are used, not the commercial ones, used for bad purposes, bad intentions. It might be used for to propagate racism, hate speech, extreme content, etc. So we wanted to have see whether okay, can we identify the consumers of very, very specific videos just by observing uh, Wi-Fi traffic. Uh, so if you don't know Dash, which is dynamic adaptive HTTP streaming, is the state of the art of video streaming. Uh, it's streaming traffic over HTTP. What it does is when you upload a video, uh, the platform creates specific chunks of the video. And each one is encoded in a different way using different compression rates based on the dynamic nature of the scene. And user usually fetches these chunks uh, based on the bandwidth availability, few, few chunks in advance. So it, it creates something like a burst structure if you observe the traffic. Right. Uh, so there are two properties which we are leveraging here when it comes to Dash. Uh, so if you think about this figure on the, on the left, what I show there is that different videos taken from YouTube, they have very different traffic envelopes. Just by looking at this, you see that each video is very different. Visually, of course, when you see the video, it is different. The same thing is visible if you observe the network traffic. That's number one. Number two is that if you actually start replaying these videos, it if the same video creates the same deterministic pattern. There will be some shifts, there will be some you know, noise based on the network conditions, different errors, but in general, the traffic envelope, this will stick, okay? So the point is that different videos have different uh, traffic envelopes, same video, multiple runs, will create almost identical traffic envelopes. So we leverage these two properties. So we thought about designing an experiment to you know, see whether we can actually identify this video. We did a very simple experiment where we use a YouTube account, we automate everything using Selenium. What this YouTube account does is it repeatedly replaces videos from 10 videos. Uh, repeated 10 videos, which we have selected. So this is our target set of videos. Uh, while these videos being replayed, we captured Wi-Fi traffic uh, using one of these Wi-Fi sniffers called as ARPK. Then we did some filtering and we create these traffic flow features for each video separately. So uh, the how you create the features is usually up to you. What we did was each video we identify bins of say 0.5 seconds, then we create a feature vector for each bin. Feature vector is something like number of packets, total number of bytes, how, how much was uplink, how much was downlink, you know, something you usually do for machine learning. And this stage we actually avoided ads because ads actually will add to the complexity of the problem where you know each time if you play a different ad at the beginning, you can't actually, you, you might need more, more work to uh, identify the traffic. So at this stage, we just uh, get rid of the ad problem, but it's a challenge we are addressing in the future. Then, you know, we, we tried different deep learning models, actually basic models, nothing fancy, CNN, LSTM, MLP. Most of them work. I mean, you could, model that we use very close to 100% accuracy. So the idea is that if you observe the traffic flow next, can you say whether it is coming from one of these 10 videos you train the model for? Generally, you know, it was perfect accuracy, but it doesn't mean anything because, you know, traffic flows, especially with Wi-Fi, things change. Uh, 
it changes based on how many other devices are there in the network, available bandwidth, noise conditions, etc. Wi-Fi channel is extreme all the time. So what we did was, okay, we had this initial experiment. We redid the experiment two weeks later. So we used the initial model and test it with the data collected two weeks later. Still, we could actually identify uh, the videos with very, very high accuracy. In fact, also we realized that we actually don't need all the features. We could even use only downlink features or even uplink features alone to get a high accuracy. It is, this is like the fundamental experiment we did, which sort of gave us the idea that this is actually possible. Next, we thought we, we became a bit more ambitious and we thought, okay, you can do this for video. Can you do that for other types of traffic uh, websites? So you have you know, different types of websites and audio streaming, another thing that is getting popular like YouTube music, uh, Spotify, etc. So we collected a data set which has different traffic types, web, video, audio, and within those traffic sites, traffic types, we have different type of specific content. With video, YouTube, it is like, you know, different videos. With web, it is different websites. With audio, it's different songs. Now we wanted to build a one single classifier, like the ring, one, one model for everything. And it turns out that we can. Actually, what we did was we used the weight sharing idea from convolutional neural networks. So we built a hierarchical traffic classifier. It has a common module to extract the features. Then at first layer, first course module, it tells you, okay, this traffic is either video, web, or audio. At the next level, it's going to predict, okay, if it is video, this traffic is coming from YouTube, Netflix, or Stan. If it is Audio, it's going to say this traffic is coming from Spotify, Sam, your YouTube music, et cetera. At the final level, the third level, it's going to say, what is the exact song? What is the exact video? It's a limited experiment, but what we found is that you could still identify uh, exact content with quite a high accuracy, right? Um, so, you know, that, we did that one. And then we realized, okay, you know, yeah, this attack is there. We showed it for new, 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 new uh, protocols, new types of networks. But you know, how about the defenses? What can we do to uh, mitigate such attacks? And then we realized that we actually don't know what are the patterns these models learn. Then we thought of, okay, you know, let's you know take these black box deep neural networks. Let's dissect them and let's try to understand what actually they are looking for. That is our second line of work. So by doing so, we wanted to achieve two things. First one is if you know how the models work, you can actually improve the attacks. And also if you know how the models work, you can actually def develop defenses. Now, you might have seen these types of figures for convolutional neural networks, which are doing image classification. The idea is that you need to identify, you need to see what are the locations of the input that contributes more to a decision. What types of patterns CNN filters look for? So we, we got inspirations from these image classification CNNs, and we apply in the 1D convolution domain, that is uh, traffic classifiers. So we will not get, you know, like nice images like this. What we get in traffic is really boring, but we borrowed the ideas from there. Uh, so we, we, we sort of did the exact same what uh, machine learning folks does. We took three open data sets. We didn't bother to collect new data. The AWDF data set is a tour traffic fingerprinting data set published in NDSS. 2018, it has 200 classes and around 2,500 uh, traces per class. DF dataset is again a, a core dataset, which 95 classes, 1,000 traces per class. And DC dataset is the 
uh, video streaming data set we collected in our previous one. So we took this three work. And before we go into details, this is how data look like. So if it is a website fingerprinting data over Tor, you will have plus ones and minus ones. Plus one indicates an upload, minus one indicates a download. Usually the packet size does not matter in Tor because as a privacy mechanism, Tor pads all the packets to 512 bytes. Uh, so in this case, AWF and DF data sets are just plus ones and minus ones. Whereas the DC data set is video streaming, so it will have this periodic burst corresponding to chunk downloads. And it's not binary because it actually downloads content, no padding, so it will have actual packet lengths. And the two CNN architectures we used, they are coming from original work. We didn't bother to change them, we just get the architectures that has been that have been proposed in the original work. Now, to go into dissecting the deep learning models, we need few ideas. The first one is what actually is a convolution? Convolution is like a weighted sum. So you have this input vector x1 to xn, you have the weight vector w1 to wa, the convolution gives you the weighted sum plus the bias. Now, where the convolution gives the maximum, it gives the maximum if the inputs really matches to the weights, both sign and the magnitude. So it's analogous to the cross correlation function if you know the signal processing back, if you have the signal processing background. So that is key idea, first idea. Now, what happens in uh, CNNs is that so the, you have this input like this, and this is a filter. A filter is having, uh, it's eight filter of size eight, and the filter values are something like minus 2.5, something close to zero, et cetera. Now what you do is you take this filter and you do some sliding window-based calculation like this. And once you do that, you will see that it gives you the highest values when this filter matches the, when the sign of this filter matches exactly the sign of the, what is happening in the input. In a way, it gives you the highest output when the filter exactly matches the input. Now, that, that is one observation. Sorry about this, let me clear this. Now, uh, that's one idea, but the, that gives you only, that works only for the input layer. But uh, networks, neural networks have stacked uh, layers. So you need something, an optimization based approach. So there we use what, it called, what is called as the gradient ascent. What gradient ascent does is that it takes a noisy input and the optimization problem try to modify that input so that for a given filter, it gives the maximum output. You take, give a noisy input, you calculate the loss in a way that it, it is calculated from one filter's output. You backpropagate, you change the noisy input a bit more, and you do this iteratively so that for a given filter, you identify what is the exact input that maximizes the filter output. Now this you can do for DC data set, which is, you know, very nice uh, values. But with AWF and DF data sets, you can't do it. Why? Because they are composed of data of plus ones and minus ones. So if you try to optimize with those values, discrete values, what happens is you get something, you know, back, you go back and forth. A plus one, when you try to optimize, become minus one, and you eventually, you don't convert. So, for AWF and DEF, what we did was, we just do it empirically. We take the input, all the input data, for each filter, we identify what part of the input gives the highest activation. So it is not optimization, it's just your calculation. Right, so once you do that, 
once you have all these ideas in place, you can actually answer questions like this. What type of patterns traffic fingerprinting CNNs learn? So what we found that it actually look for transitions. So if there are periods where continuous uploads or downloads, CNN actually don't care. This is important, I'll come to that later. Then we figure out, okay, you know, if you take this time series of trace, is there a very specific part where the CNNs focus more? It turns out, yes, uh, for website, it's actually focusing only on the initial parts of the trace. Trace doesn't care. And if you go to video fingerprinting, actually it is caring, it's, it considers everything. Because it makes sense with videos, you actually have these periodic bursts and the classifier needs to focus about them. And with that, uh, also we answered a few other questions using the same method, whether only the initial part is enough to train the model. Can we do transfer learning for traffic? Yes, we can. And also we, we, were, explained, we were able to explain why actually 1D CNNs are better than RNNs when it comes to traffic classification. This was an observation, I mean, Networking community has been using 1D CNNs over RNNs for traffic classification without actually knowing what is the case. So what we found is that because of this shifting average thing in 1D convolutions, they are more resilient to noise and works better than RNNs. I will skip this one considering the time, but this is just a summary of what we observed. So what happened is that with these observations in mind, we could actually go back and improve existing defenses, which have been developed without any sort of, you know, theoretical background. There are different ways of adding noise to traffic. For example, front is an idea uh, published in USNIC security, I think. So what, what it does this is that if you have a trace, you insert noise, you just use a Rayleigh distribution to figure out where to add noise. So what we did was that, okay, yeah, you can do that, but the model actually want more noise in the beginning. So we added noise to the beginning and we showed that you don't have to add noise for the upload and download both. You can add noise only for one side. Okay. So what we got was that, okay, this actually works way better. Uh, so if you, uh, here, the way to read this table is that less accuracy is the better. So accuracy is the success of the attacker. So if you don't do anything, attacker is successful 95% of the time. But if you use front or front view, attacker is successful about 72%, 76% time, so about 20% drop. But there is a caveat. You, you want to add as less noise as possible because it adds to the bandwidth, it adds to the user's cost. So what we showed is that using the insights we learned from the CNNs, we could actually have a better attack with lesser overheads. Similarly, so this is for website traffic. Uh, for streaming traffic, we developed something called as Toma, again, using the ideas of CNNs and we, we could get, you know, you know, better drop in accuracy. And we did another one using generative adversarial networks called as SMUG. We, we didn't, I didn't include it in the presentation. Okay, so that's, you know, how you use the insights taken from the, uh, you know, dissecting the CNNs. And next part, the final part, I'm going to talk a bit about what is called as this open test set classification. Now, if you train a basic convolutional neural network or any kind of classifier, it is closed set. In this case, I'm training a closed set classifier to train birds. Magpies, blue jays, ostrich. Now, if I give a picture of a, an aeroplane or, or a tree or a dog or a cloud, it's going to classify this image into one of the known classes. The classifier actually doesn't know when it doesn't know. Uh, in a way, this, if you go to defense terminology, this is like what is called as the known unknowns. Basically, the classifier doesn't know how to handle known unknowns. This is a huge problem when it comes to traffic classification, mainly because 
there are millions of traffic flows and you don't want to make predictions of all these traffic flows. You want to identify, okay, this is something interesting to me. So I'm going to send it to the classifier. This is something not interesting. So all these traffic classification work done to date, what we, what we observed is that there are three things. Either they don't focus on the open set traffic classification problem. They just operate on a closed set and show the results, which is not realistic. Or else they do two things. They do background class. That is, they assume there is some known unknowns at the training time. You combine them together with one class, add them as a new class, you train the model. That's one way. The other one is SOCMAS thresholding. That is, you use the classifier's confidence to make a decision, okay, whether this is from the closed set or the open set. Now, we, uh, when we uh, dig deeper, we realize that actually these, these are having issues. For example, if you think about the background class, so this is a simple example. The dots, the bluish colors are from the closed set. So you train the model for them and you get these clusters. Okay, so you get clusters. You get four clusters for the four known classes. The stars, the greenish colors, I treat them as the background class. I treat them as the fifth class, include in the training process. Good, they will give you another cluster. But the unknown unknowns, when I include them in the inference process, their distribution is random. Ideally, they should be concatenated here, but this brownish color, they are everywhere. So background class literally doesn't work. So if a paper actually published that background class work, that's pure chance. Uh, same goes with uh, this of max thresholding. Uh, this is this is very easy to explain. We know that there is this softmax layer at the end skews the probabilities. What happens with deep learning models is that even it makes a flawed or error prediction, its confidence is high. So you can't usually use softmax thresholding to separate open set and close set. This, if you think about this one, the example I show. Here, the softmax score is very high, close to 1% for both open set and close set. So you literally can't differentiate it using softmax. So what we did was we wanted a method where we don't, didn't want to assume that there are no non zones. At the training time, we have only close set examples and we have no idea what what are the unknown examples we will get in time in future? And we borrowed some methods from uh, computer vision, uh, open max, class anchor clustering, joint confidence. I'll not go into details. And also we came up with our own methods using neuron activation patterns. And we across multiple data sets, we compare where these methods stand. Uh, I will again not go into details, but the takeaway message was that softmax thresholding and background class really gives you inconclusive results. The results are inconsistent if you, you know, repeat it with multiple splits of the same data. And we found that actually class anchor clustering, if you borrow ideas from computer vision, it seems to work with the uh, traffic classification, you get very decent results, but there are there is room for uh, improvement. And with the open video streaming data sets, we found that things are really unstable, show very high variance in accuracy. It's partly because they are quite prone to noise as well as they are small in terms of number of classes. Okay. Um, those are the main takeaway messages. And I think that's pretty much it. Uh, so just before I conclude, you know, the things we are working on these days, we, we, we work on open set classification because we know that some of the methods from computer vision works, but we need to really customize them to work more in traffic classification. And also we want to 
work on the open world classification problem. That is, how can you continuously learn as traffic classes or as network traces come by? If you start with the 100 class classifier, how can you make it 120, 150 class classifier as the data stream? Handling the concept drift. Uh, remember I talked about the advertisement example. And you know there will be concept drift with network traffic. It can be based on the advertisements. It can be based on the structural changes of the website. How we are going to handle it, we actually don't know. And we need to consider about transferability. So if you collect data from Mozilla Firefox, will it work with any other browsers? And finally, the most important one is how can we embed these defenses into the protocol itself? So can we take Dash, we have these defenses based on simulated data. How can we actually engineer them into the protocol stack? That is something major we are working on. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Uh, let me give a quick overview of the research group as well to conclude. Uh, yeah, so the research group here at UC uh, is pretty small. So we have about five, six PhD students, another four or five uh, uh, owners, research capstone students, and a bunch of interns. So altogether about 15 students working on uh, various security projects. So our theme is very simple. We work on using AI for attacks, and also we work on security of AI itself. So in a way, AI-driven attacks and attacks on AI, that's where we work on. Within that, we work on mobile security, IOT security, network security, IOT serving machine learning, all these topics. Um, we have been receiving quite a lot of funding from ARC, DSTG, Defense Innovation Network. We got some from Google. We work a bit with Thales, uh, Axiata Digital Labs is another company we work with. And we are always, you know, we're really interested with collaborating with similar research groups. Uh, that's why I responded to Ali when he contacted me. We are always open for collaboration. And, you know, there is quite a lot of overlaps happening from what I understand with your research group. Uh, with that, you know, I will stop here and take any questions you have. Thank you. I think that's, that's quite, I mean, basically interesting and fascinating. So I let, I mean, other people to drive the question session. I mean, I can see that thing, uh, Mehdi, you might have some question or other people, of course, I mean, I said Mehdi, other people would also have question because recently we are uh, talking about side channel attack uh, with some researcher in Turkey as well. As far as, uh, you know, that I mean, it's, it's really, uh, Great work you're doing, I mean, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, adversarial machine learning and then the use of the machine learning for security. There are a number of researchers working here, but we mainly focus on uh, detecting uh, the vulnerability in the software. Right. And right. since, I mean, network and the mobile, they are all software. So maybe, you know, that uh, we, uh, at some stage, we can give you some perspective. We take uh, that how we say that, you know, most of the things are software. And uh, so is the case whether it's a network traffic or network protocols and uh, all those sorts of, sort of thing. And then as far as adversarial machine learning is concerned, that's also the area which uh, is explored starting from Bushra's research on phishing attacks. Mm -hmm. And so is the case over work on uh, quality of the data when build the model. So when you are looking into, you know, that I mean, explainable AI, in that respect, so that's mean uh, we are you know, starting from the data, ensuring the data quality, and uh, if the data is compromised or basically noisy data, you know that I mean that respect. So that's uh, also the point of it. So I let uh, you know that these researcher who lead, I mean uh, those uh, part to briefly have the question or comment, they can quickly uh, relate their research in some way, because I plan to have a follow up meeting with uh, Suranga uh, very soon. Uh, to identify one or two concrete areas where we can start working. So that's mean the model is same, which we use. That's mean starting small and then scaling very fast. Uh, hopefully collaboration goes good uh, in that aspect. All right. 
I let people to. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> I have a question. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'd like to ask that the shape of the graphs of the traffic uh, uh, distribution that you show, uh, is it same shape for different devices? I mean, if you watch different traffic, so will it be the same or no? Uh, so it's not the same, but in, so if you consider like you replay the same video using say, Firefox and you know Safari. It's not the same. There, there are like you know device specific, browser specific changes. But those things what we see is that either you can add them to the you know you you don't need to repeat the experiments that much. The fundamental shape is still there. The other you can sort of you know consider it as noise. So most of the time model can actually capture those differences. But if you if the model doesn't capture, you probably need to bootstrap or give some, you know, some fraction of data from the other, other devices. But there may be like, you know, really different, really big differences. For example, if you think about, you know, browsing a page with uh, Linux versus Ubuntu. So what we see is there is quite a lot of scope to do, you know, address this transferability problem. Uh, you can stretch the limits, but also, you know, in some cases, it's just, you know, adding a few more data points. That's it. Did that answer your question? Uh, yes, maybe just to continue on this. So if you think um, like two videos have very similar shape, can you say something about the actual video itself? Ah, uh, no, I don't think so, uh, because you know it. You might, uh, it can be a nature video and it can be a, you know some other video, but usually there are sort of differences. If the fast-paced video will have you know a certain pattern compared to you know very very static like a fireplace video. But you know, in general, you can't say go back, trace it back to the semantic similarity of the content just based on the traffic. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for your presentation. I have a question. Uh, what would uh, happen to the accuracy of your model, for example, if suddenly the the number of packets that are transmitting right now over the Wi-Fi. What if, like, the user ch like change the quality of the video? What would happen to the model? Right. Um, so that is an that is not a condition we simulated in our experiment. So what might happen is that if there are more users doing different things, then this there will be delays because the bandwidth is shared between all the users. Uh, so what we observed is a pretty congested environment. We cal uh, collected this data at UCS, UTS, where the, the students, you know, in a student hall. Uh, I wish I could give you an answer whether there is a definitive answer for that. Theoretically, what we expect is the pattern should change. But collecting data for a week within real world conditions, what we observed is that it actually didn't change. Uh, so maybe we, you know, our experiment conditions were very same where it has always, you know, around 50, 100 users doing very similar things. So I can't give you a conclusive answer, but we also expect that it to change. In our experiment, it just didn't change. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, one more uh, quick question related to this. What do you think would happen if uh, people start uh, pre-downloading videos and then watching after? Well, not very efficient. Would it hide some of the patterns? Well, yes. So, so there are two things, right? So what we see in Dash streaming is a version of pre-download. Usually the browser download through two, three chunks in advance. You will see in Netflix. Even at the worst conditions, you don't see stalling in Netflix because they actually prefetch things quite quite fast. 
uh, that type of case the model can address but you know if you download the thing in bulk it becomes a different problem you know you you know, download the entire thing you basically you can't you can't do this but if cert uh, prefetching to a certain amount of level that was already captured in data and you know we the model can actually handle it thanks um Hi, uh, it was a very interesting talk by you. I'm interested to know about, like, have you considered the vision scenarios? Like, how, what are the scenarios on which your model can be avoided and how you are going to make it more robust against it? Because, yeah, because, yeah, as Professor Lee mentioned, I'm working on adversarial machine learning. So, means basically, we keep on seeing that how we can avoid the model and evaluate its security. So did you- uh, uh, you, you mean the adversarial uh, type of attacks against the model? Is that your question? Yes, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so that's, a, you know, that's something we just literally don't have the bandwidth to do, but yeah. yeah. So there are defenses based on what is called as these universal perturbations. So there are certain types of perturbations it doesn't matter what is the original data point. It doesn't matter what is the model. So once you generate these data, po uh, you know, adversarial patterns, you can add it to any data point and make an error. The, and the classifier will make an error. So there have been some work where, recent work where they actually tried this idea on network traffic, which is a pretty cool idea that you take the adversarial, yeah. you know, universal perturbation, you use it as a defense. Yes, it's a very, very interesting thing to do. It's just that right now we don't have the bandwidth to do it, but it's something definitely one can do. Yeah, and because because the issue with the current state of the art of adversity and machine learning in cybersecurity is that the models that are built by the security experts, they do not make them public for reproducibility and evaluating their security. This is one of the thing, and maybe uh, we can collaborate uh, with if Professor Wan on testing your model against the perturbations. And then, yeah, because you have closely worked on this area, so you might know that what constraints are required uh, that needs to be met in order to make this kind of traffic or attack malicious. Like it should be a side channel attack. Uh, the, the perturbation should not uh, invalidate that. So, yeah. Right, right. So yeah, so that's, you know, that's a very interesting idea. Actually recently this guy, uh, Nicholas Pepenot, he's one of the, you know, key researchers in adversarial uh, attacks. Mm -hmm. And he published a paper where how you can fool an intrusion detection system using adversarial perturbation, right? Compared mm -hmm. to images, there are a few semantics you need to consider about web traffic because there are packet length limitations. There are, you know, delay limitations. After a while, if you increase, you can't in arbitrarily increase packet lengths. You can't, you know, arbitrarily delay packets. Then the middle boxes are going to identify this is an anomaly. They are going to drop them, right? So this adversarial perturbation in terms of traffic becomes a constraint optimized like a constraint optimization problem not like the you know the l2 distance type you do it for uh, images Image yeah. yeah but you need some sort of semantic constraints okay you know if i modify this parameter it can't go beyond this one and so it's it's a bit more trickier perturbation than images yeah 